get started. Uh, we're a little past 1030. So thank you all for being here. We were uh, having some technical difficulties, which happens in this uh, age of uh, Zoom and virtual conversations. Um, my name is Jason Dake. I am Curator of Education here at the Denos Museum Center. I am, as you can see, working from home today. Uh, and I'm joined by Craig Hadley, our Executive Director, who is in the galleries with the Pulped Under Pressure exhibition, uh, and Chelsea Nimi, who is in the offices at the Denos, helping us uh, run the show behind the scenes. Uh, we are in Zoom. We all are also live on Facebook. Uh, you are welcome to add uh, questions to the chat. We'll try to keep an eye on those and share those later in the conversation. And of course, I'm pleased to be joined by Marilyn Prop as well, one of the artists that is featured in the exhibition. Uh, this is our third conversation on this exhibition. We've had three different uh, artists work with us and talk with us about their work in the show. Uh, we're so excited to, to have her today. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand it over to Craig Hadley, who will get us started. Okay. Thanks, Jason. So uh, Jason's right. This is the third of our series for Pulped Under Pressure, and it's so nice to have you today, Marilyn, joining us thank virtually. You. So thank you for, thanks for taking some time out of your morning to be with us. Appreciate sure. it. Uh, just a quick reminder, Jason's been good about doing this on the other videos, but um, we're normally wearing masks, of course, in the museum. We're closed to the public right now in the morning. Um, I'm the only one over here in, you know, 6,000 square feet of exhibit space, so that's why I don't have a mask on right now. But if you do visit us, please know that uh, we do require it in the building. Uh, you know, Marilyn, one thing I did, of course, is I jumped on your website and spent some time <laughs> reading about you, you know, went through your CV and uh, take a look at what you've been doing. And we do share a few commonalities. One is huh. that we are both graduates of the, the University of Missouri system. Ah, so great. I saw that, that your MA is from University of Missouri, Kansas. Kansas City, uh, yeah. And, and I graduated from University of Missouri, St. Louis uh, ah. with my master's. So we both share that in common at least. Cool. Uh, uh. In, in any event, uh, nice to have you today. The program's pretty straightforward. We're in the gallery, of course, uh, for Pulped Under Pressure. And we're just gonna spend a little bit of time taking a look at some of your works on display, um, ask you a little bit about what maybe you're working on uh, in the studio during quarantine. But I figured we could start, uh, of course, with, let me switch the camera here, uh, with your Divers series. And okay. so, Maybe you could just tell us a little bit about your background, of course, as an artist, and then maybe uh, tell viewers a little bit about this particular series uh, that's on display at the Denos. Okay. Um, let's see. Well, um, I got my undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania, and at that point I vowed I was going to be a painter. Uh, I went up to Skowhegan, Maine, to the Skowhegan School of Painting and Drawing after I graduated. Uh, Brooklyn Museum Art School for a year, which is no longer in existence, um, but it was a wonderful place where all, about eight painters were there. Um, Crown Sam Workshop and then out to the San Francisco Art Institute for the pre-MFA program. Um, I always identified as a painter. Um, I met my current partner, spouse, person in San Francisco and we traveled across the country to uh, Louisville, Kentucky where I participated with him at the Center for Photographic Studies. I had my painting studio upstairs, so I was very much involved in the, in the photo community. Uh, we moved to Kansas City, where I became somewhat involved with the community there, although maintained a painting studio, uh, started teaching, um, and uh, we moved to Chicago in 1987. In 1990, David and I, my, my spouse, uh, founded Anchor Graphics, which is a Chicago not-for-profit print shop, um, and one of the first organizations to actually begin a social practice, um, where we had free uh, high school classes uh, for kids to come in and do printmaking. Um, I started teaching at Columbia College in 2002. Um, meanwhile, Anchor Graphics was thriving, and um, we had, uh, we, uh, created edition, we printed editions. My husband was the master printer there, David Jones. And um, so I, I got very involved in the printmaking community while maintaining my studio practice as a painter. 
um, I met Mel Potter and uh, about 2012, I decided since I was teaching at Columbia to take a few classes. So I took paper making one semester and then I took paper making for a second semester. And all of a sudden I was, I entered into the world of paper making, but I really approached it as a painter. Um, when I would uh, use the beaten pulp and put it in a vat, I would pigment the, 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 the wet pulp. And then I would drag my fingers through, gloved of course, <laughs> with pigment on them, uh, through the wet vat and create forms. And then uh, when I would place the paper on a felt, um, I would again do pulp painting on it with pigmented pulp. And so I'm still using my sense of color and a painting and a mark making. Um, however, I was really painting into the fibers of the paper. Um, it wasn't enough for me to just have beautiful paper. So after 25 years of watching printmakers, um, I decided that I was going to, that block, block work really worked for me, um, wood blocks and linoleum blocks. And so I started um, printing onto my handmade paper. Um, so in 2016, David and I moved to Kenosha, Wisconsin. Uh, Anchor Graphics was downsized, and so we're planning to start it up again in Milwaukee, but we are including paper making now as part of our outreach. Um, so we work with professional artists, we publish, we work with kids, and we have a press on wheels, which is a truck with an elevator. Um, and so we can lower the press down, we can bring all of our paper making equipment into communities. And then when we're finished with all of our work, our workshops, um, we can put them back in the elevator, bring it up into the truck and come back to Kenosha. So, um, <clears throat> But my studio practice is really um, a little bit separate in that um, the Gulf oil spill has really influenced my imagery. Uh, in 2010, in the Gulf of Mexico, as you all know, was the great uh, oil spill. And I was already working with machine parts and industrial imagery, but they were rather whimsical. Uh, and they were, were animated, uh, cartoon-like forms bouncing along in a landscape. And the landscape came from my Wyoming residency at Gentile earlier. Um, but after the Gulf oil spill, I started to, they became more ominous and they began to block uh, sea life. So the work that's in uh, the museum now is some of my earliest forays into this subject matter and into paper making and adding prints. Uh, my current work has just expanded on that uh, so I have layer upon layer upon layer of block prints. Um, I started uh, cutting out the block prints and collaging them onto the paper. Um, there's a video on YouTube that I can connect you to eventually that shows me making large sheets of paper in our backyard. I had an intern help me do that um, with what's called a decal box. And um, the turtle still recurs. Um, the turtle is a symbol of longevity, uh, endurance, perseverance, travels for long distances, uh, overcomes obstacles. And so it's not only a symbol for the sea life that is blocked by all of this debris and waste in the oceans, but it's also a symbol of the artist and how we just endure and keep working uh, through obstacles and persevere. Uh, so, um, and the circle, of course, I always work with the circle. Um, the circle represents uh, interconnectedness, interdependence, continuity. Um, and I just, I like the way the circle helps me to create a sense of movement around uh, compositionally and the forms. Uh, if in the new work, they're really moving rapidly around inside that circle. Uh, can, can you talk a little bit about, um, at least with this body of work, the sort of planning process that was involved? Um, were, did, did some of these works, were they sort of born out of sketches or ideas? Or <laughs> well, generally, kind of what's the, the working process for you? Um, I, I rarely work from sketches and ideas. As a painter, I always use gestural physical marks to make kind of calligraphic marks on the, on the white uh, 
panels and then I would sort of begin to see the forms emerge. And I do the same thing with the paper. Um, when I have the forming paper in front of me, I have this gridded material and I place it down on the surface and then I, I squeeze or pat pigmented pulp uh, through the grid to create texture. And I move that gesturally through the circle. And when the paper is dry, those movements, those passages of color kind of tell me where I want to put the forms. Now I do have to draw out the forms so I can transfer them to the block and then carve them out. But that's always been part of my process as a building process and a cutting out and a rebuilding. The difference is uh, I, only if I do the collage work can I move the images around as I could in painting. Uh, and so I prefer that method now of uh, collage of cutting out my prints and collaging them onto the surface in such a way that they actually meld into the surface. They don't really look like they're collaged so much. Um, but the pigment that I have put in previously is, is embedded into the fiber. It's, it is part of the paper. Um, and that's where my painting background really comes in. Um, I, I don't really sketch. I just kind of jump in and move things around and intuitively respond to the marks in the paper. Yeah, how, you know, I think for a lot of artists, it's tough to sometimes let go of a work or, you know, sometimes have a sense that, that this piece is done, that this is finished. But for you, um, you know, is, is there sort of a, a moment or um, something with this body of work that for you signified that a work was complete or felt like, um, you know, okay, I need to leave this alone now. I, I, I think I'm done. Oh, good question. Um, the, the work at the museum is all pretty, pretty finished. However, I may go back into it when I get it back. I just had a solo, sh two solo shows last summer. I was really busy, uh, last fall actually. Uh, one was at the Racine Museum uh, and one was at a gallery in Milwaukee. And I felt like the work was completely finished. Um, the work, the current work is much more cluttered and busy than the work at the, the current work that you're showing. However, it has the pretty much the same kind of movement, uh, just a lot, a lot more energy to it. Anyway, I got all that work back from the two solo shows and I've started to, <laughs> I realized they weren't, a lot of them weren't finished. And so I rebuilt them, I combined them, much like this one where I would take two circles and then adhere them together to make a larger piece. Um, so, uh, I guess in answer to your question, I think they're finished. Uh, you can see the gridding there where I, I press the, I, I actually move the pigmented pulp through the grid and press it into the surface. Um, and then th the shape at the bottom center is actually printed onto the paper um, as are, well, everything is actually printed onto the paper. There's no collaging here uh, other than the two pieces of paper. Uh, adhered together. Um, but yeah, when I get pieces back, I look at them, I live with them, and I decide I want to keep going on them and, and build build more. And sure. I work like that as a painter. I get my pieces back from shows and I think, hmm, eh, I don't think I'll keep going on this one. <laughs> right. I, I'm going to wheel us over. This is, um, of course, this series is a little larger than some of the other works in the gallery. Yeah. I'm going to wheel us across the gallery and then uh, we'll encounter your smaller series. Maybe we can okay. spend some time with that. Okay. Ah, there they are. And by the way, I love, I really love those dark gray walls. That's how I map them when I frame these pieces, that dark gray. Yeah, we, uh, we, we've had this dark gray for several shows and it's worked pretty well um, for the last few installations that we've had. So I'm, I'm gonna park us right here for a moment um, okay. and then I can, I can recenter of course, but maybe you could speak a little bit about the smaller series. Um, if there's okay. anything in particular that you'd like me to, to highlight, I can do that. Um. Yeah, let's let's zoom in on the one on the on the left, uh, and we can look. We can talk. I can talk about that one. Um, so I am still, uh, however many years later, these were twenty fourteen. So six years later, I'm still using those 
block prints of the um, form on the bottom left, which is pretty typical of what I'm doing. The, the industrial waste, the pipes, the machine parts, the debris in the ocean, they're actually morphing into marine forms. Um, so they look sort of familiar, but then they also look like plant life or marine life of some sort. Um, the same with the whatever it is on the top left. I, I sort of invent these forms. Um, I, my source material is, is machine parts, but then I elaborate on them. Um, I still use the, the turtles, the small turtle. You'll see a very faint one on the right. And then those dragged marks of dark blue are where I actually uh, drag my fingers with gloves on that are pigmented through the wet uh, pulp before the paper forms. Um, but you yeah. can see, oh, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to say, you know, as machine parts, they still read as being very organic the way yes. that they're, you know, that you render them. And so yeah. they do take on this sort of um, quasi living form, you know, yeah. <laughs> at least the way you sort of read them. So yeah, good, good. Because that's what I want. I want them to be morphing. Uh, it's it, in a sense, it's sort of like the, all the debris in the ocean will hopefully be taken over and turned into um, parts of the ocean that aren't so damaging. Right. Um, so the, this one, that. this one down here has always sort of struck me as this sort of like jellyfish form or, <laughs> yeah. you know, like a, like a mushroom or something, some kind right. of, some kind of marine life. Yeah. Like a spinning top that has suddenly become an amoeba or a, um, a lot of them look like uh, microorganisms because I, I do look at pictures of microorganisms in the ocean and somehow uh, I you asked if I do drawings I do some drawings but a lot of it I just absorb and then it comes out uh, from what I've looked at you will notice that the magnets are painted uh, to match the surface of the paper uh, so I'm really glad you matched them up because uh, in some exhibits they don't quite get them in the right places I, I'm hoping for them to be camouflaged, but of course, light and shadow makes it so you can see them. Uh, this is sure. a, a lot of passages of the movement you can see uh, moving through of that, that warm color uh, that guides where I'm going to put things, where I'm going to put my, sh my imagery. Did, did, you, did you always envision the series sort of floating or, you know, having this, this sort of sculptural you know, installation or quality to it uh, um. <laughs> to sort of highlight highlight the paper and yeah, give it some I, yeah. dimensionality or was it ever framed at some point? Sometimes I will frame them because when people buy them, they want them framed, but I, I don't really like them enclosed in a frame. I really think they work well with this idea of them floating across the wall. I, I want them to be like an experience of looking into the water, whether you're in the water looking up. Everything has this kind of, uh, I wouldn't say amorphous, but this sort of sense of being in a watery environment. Um, some of the newer work uh, really pushes that with this kind of turquoise blue background. Um, and, and things layered and floating. Not much different from what's in the show here at the museum that we're looking at, just um, a continuation of new shapes. Um, so yeah, when I was first started making paper and we were critiquing them, actually Mel's graduate students were my teachers, and we had a critique and I had these big sheets floating on the wall and all of my fellow students said, what if you put lights behind them? What if you do this and that? And so I, I did put lights behind some very translucent abaca pieces at my recent show at the Racine Art Museum. Um, and it worked okay. We floated some of them in front of a window and that worked well. Uh, these are all cotton, so it's a little, it's not as translucent as abaca. Um, this one again, uh, you can see the passages where I've moved my hand through the pigment. Um, I think this is called Travelers, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, I think it is Travelers. And um, so I like to use, and I talk to my students about this a lot, I like to use cropping. Um, I never, I almost never use horizontal or vertical movement. Everything's on a diagonal and sometimes 
diagonally, asymmetrically opposed diagonally, like these two um, kind of gear-like, cog-like, amoeba-like forms or microorganism forms. Um, it creates more movement, it creates more energy, and I have always, ever since I started painting as a wee little artist, always diagonals, uh, always attracted to movement and energy in my work. I'm going to flip my camera around here. Oh, okay. um, so I thought, you know, we've got just a few minutes left, but I thought maybe you could share with us a little bit about um, how you're spending time these days, um, socially distanced uh, um, and, and staying healthy. But, uh, you know, are, is there a new body of work that, that you're engaged with? Have you revisited um, some of this series or, or given more thought to it? Um, I, yes, in answer to all your questions, <laughs> um, I am keeping well and, and healthy. I'm working in my gardens a lot. We, when we moved to Kenosha, we inherited this, or we bought this house that has about seven gardens around it. So uh, doing that in the studio, I still have paper left over from the paper we made um, two summers ago. And so I'm cutting some new blocks. I'm also beginning to think about returning to painting in a way. So I've been uh, think cutting out shape, puzzle pieces that come together as a circle. Um, I, have a, my, I have a whole wall of my new paper pieces in my studio. Um, and if you go to the website, you can see um, a lot of the new work and also the video of me making large sheets of paper in the backyard. Uh, and so you can go to propjonesstudio.com, that's P-R-O-P-P-J-O-N-E-S-S-T-U-D-I-O, all one word, dot com. And if you go to my part of the site, Prop Studio, or just in news, there's a, the video showing me making paper. I'm thinking of making more paper this summer, but I've got to wait till fall so all the bees and the wasps are not so active back there. <laughs> so, uh, go for yeah. long walks, bike rides, staying healthy, yeah. <laughs> sure. Well, wonderful. It was it was a real pleasure to have you today. Is there Thank anything you. else that you'd like to comment on in the gallery or um, oh, gosh. share with visitors? Um, I did want to talk just a hair about Julia Goodman's pieces because um, she is an amazing artist and she, uh, I actually invited her to be on a panel with me at the Southern Graphics uh, Council International Conference. Um, she has sliced beets that she puts into her work. They're very fragile, beautiful, but strong at the same time pieces. Uh, and also a shout out to Rennie and Mel to thank them for uh, curating me into this show. Uh, I got to know Rennie when I was um, uh, interim gallery director at the Center for Book and Paper, um, documenting all her work. And uh, so, uh, and putting up her paper cuts show. So I got to know her work very well. Uh, so I guess, I guess that's it. Thanks. I, I want to thank them all and thank you. It's really a pleasure to be part of this show and I appreciate being able to talk about the work. Sure. Well, we, you know, again, we appreciate you taking time to, to be with us today virtually uh, at the Dennis Museum Center in Traverse City. Uh, for those of you who are, are live with us today or you're going to watch this maybe in the next week or so, uh, Pulped Under Pressure and um, 40 Chances are both on display through the 16th of August. So uh, we also have Ergo Sum, A Crow A Day. Um, we have three shows up. So if you get a chance to see any of those, come on out and um, we'll hope to see you soon. So take care and stay healthy. Great. Thank